Down today. Great. So uh, let's make sure we ask the first question we ask of our guests is where are you geographically in the U.S.? <laughs> geographically in the U.S. right now, I'm in Long Island City in Queens. Okay, so you're in New York. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been riding out the pandemic in the city. That's what I've heard from. Um, so um, so welcome. Um, I wanted to introduce. Uh, you two, uh, there's a few, few of them are gonna be coming in. Uh, Mike is here, Randy, Jordan, Mike. So um, what you're looking is at the current class, uh, the MFE class, uh, they are all uh, just joined in, uh, in September. Uh, they got lots of questions for you, but before we let, let before I let them have you, uh for obvious reason maybe what you um you could give us a they already know your background a bit of your background but one thing they don't know is how after you graduated how did you get that first job or at least the first internship right now obviously they're more interested in internships some of them actually are um our one-year program but um so tell us a little bit more about how did you get that first job sure um, well, I'll start with my first real internship, which yes, I actually please. did um, after my senior year of uh, undergraduate at Lehigh. Um, then I went and did the one-year uh, master's program in finance or analytical finance. I believe it's MFE now. Um, yes. But so the way I got that first internship, which was with Deutsche Bank, was through on-campus recruiting events. Um, Lehigh had done a great job of bringing in a bunch of potential employers and hosting events where you could, uh, you know, meet the different companies that were extending internship offers. And that was just a very valuable resource to uh, be able to land that first internship, which is obviously critical to landing your first full time offer. Um, so I actually didn't end up uh, with a full time offer out of my internship. So after my master's program, I was able to get a full-time role with Morgan Stanley, and that was through uh, networking with actually some other students that had done the master's program with me. Um, so my, my advice to, uh, you know, the, the upcoming um, class is obviously take advantage of all of the events that Lehigh offers, get out there, talk to people, network, even if it doesn't come naturally to you, certainly didn't come naturally to me. Um, but that's very valuable in um, how you get you know your first job out of college. Um, yeah. And then, how did you get to? So you, I think you 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 started at Morgan Stanley. Yeah. So I started at Morgan Stanley for, and I was with them for about a year after my master's program. I was working in credit risk reporting there, um, and then I made the move over to Cerberus, which is a private equity slash hedge fund um, on the operations side. And I've actually been there for the past, what is it now, eight years, wow, time flies. Um, but yeah, that, that was also a job that I got through um, a peer in the master's program who had recently started with them and there was an opening. We had a good friendship and a good working relationship, so, so he recommended me. Um, so again, reiterate the point that networking is everything. Um, and, and I can actually say as, so I'm in a managerial role now and I've hired a number of people over the years and at least half of them have come through, you know, personal recommendations from other people on the team. And from the manager's perspective, it's actually makes a lot of sense. It might, you know, seem like nepotism or something like that from the outside looking in. But, you know, when you're hiring somebody, you're signing up um, for, you know, hopefully a long working relationship. And the interview process, you know, is really relatively short. You, you interview them a few times, ask some technical questions, but you're still taking a pretty big risk. So, you know, having someone that you already trust uh, that can vouch for someone new, um, that's really valuable. So, um, you know, forming those relationships is really critical, both in starting your career and I think, you know, continuing to progress it throughout. And, and that's something that I'm pushing um, heavily uh, this year. Um, to make sure that you know you get your classwork done, which obviously that's important, but also you need to develop, to develop uh, relationships, uh, you know, so that at least they they get a feel for. And you're right when you interview someone, unless it's uh, you know it was interviews where they ask you a bunch of technical questions. But even that, even if you ace that, you don't know what kind of person you're going to be working with. Are they going to stick around for a long time? And especially in private equity, you know, it, you do. You know, you do share lots of information, 
and uh, you don't want to be pulled uh, hopping around too exactly. many times. Uh, exactly. So, so what, what do you do yeah, now? Yeah, so now, um, so right now I manage the, uh, a team at Cerberus, which we call investment operations. So we essentially handle the middle and back office functions for almost everything that Cerberus does. So Cerberus, if anyone's familiar, is a fairly large, you know, asset manager, private equity, hedge fund style um, place, uh, manage about 45 billion right now. Um, and it's across a bunch of different trading strategies. So, you know, we have a big mortgage business, private equity, which we're mostly known for historically, um, non-performing loans, emerging markets, corporate bond trading. So we do a bunch of different stuff. And my team oversees, like I say, in the middle and back office functions for all of our investment strategies. So it's really a grab bag of a lot of different things. But um, some examples are working very closely with uh, the traders. So there's a few TAs that report to me. Um, making sure that our portfolio and trading activity is properly reflected in all of our systems, our trading systems, our accounting systems. Um, we handle collateral and margin for the firm as a whole. We do a bunch of reporting, exposure reporting, things like that. Um, yeah, and a lot of ad hoc work, project management, working on new deals, figuring them out. So it's it's pretty, pretty wide um, variety of, of things that, that my team's responsible for. And uh, do you, so how did you, um, your, your, your background, your education, how, how are you using that now? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question, dear. So I personally didn't end up in, you know, a highly quantitative role, you know, financial modeling, the sort of things that you, you would learn in the, uh, the master's program. But um, even though I don't, you know, my job isn't solely focused on that, I think having that knowledge has um, really helped me out because I can speak with the people that do you know, work on those things. I can speak with our bond valuations teams. I can speak with our traders and understand what they're talking about when they're talking about different risk metrics, DVO1s, portfolio sensitivities, things like that, um, which you know, not everyone on the operations side can. Um, and also my undergrad, so my undergraduate degree was in accounting at Lehigh, so I can speak very well with the accountants. So I think that, you know, sort of this ability to understand a lot of different sides of the business and how they fit together has helped me a lot personally to be able to, you know, progress my career and advance into a managerial position because I can work well with a bunch of different groups. You know, even though I'm not an accountant to CPA, I can speak accounting language. I'm not doing financial modeling, but I can speak with, you know, the valuation guys. Um, so I, you know, I think having that wide variety of knowledge on a, on a lot of different things is pretty helpful. But you know this. This is uh, this is the first one that comes up. Actually, it's an interesting thing that you just said. Is that well, you graduated in 2012, right? Okay. So now you you know because at the end of the day, yeah, everybody wants to get a quant job when they come out. But but at some point, you're going to let the modeling with someone else. I mean, you, you can't be a managing director and still. Right. So at some point, like in your case, you're moving up, you're going to be you're going to be taken away from that core quant world, unless you unless you're a quant trader and that's all you do 24 uh, seven. I'm feeling the division at some point is, yeah, it helps you to get into the place. But then ultimately, you know, you get on more um, responsibilities and you you expand beyond that. And, and this is kind of what it looks like. It ha I mean, all the other ones that we people that we've spoken to, I mean, they, they had just graduated, so they're still within either risk management or, but you seem to have taken on more, um, right? So you, you need yeah. to be able to. Yeah, it's a great point, you know, they, and I think that generally works that way in many industries. I mean, there's obviously exceptions. I think if you go into, you know, software engineering and like the FANG companies, you can be a highly technical person your whole career and be fine. Or like you said, if you're a quant trader, but outside of those exceptions, really, once you get past the first few years, if you want to start progressing, you know, your career and moving up, it becomes more about the technical expertise of the day to day. And, you know, that is the foundation for what you go on to do. But it becomes about, you know, can you work with other people? Can you manage other people? Can you kind of understand holistic goals, meet deliverables, you know, some of those more, you know, softer skills, if you will. Yeah. Guys, any, any question for, uh, for Adam? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, so I'm curious which specific classes you took uh, in the program uh, were most helpful uh, for any of your roles uh, after you graduated. I'll see. I'm making me dig back a ways now. But um, 
I think um, a lot of the, uh, you know, overall like derivative, I forget what it's called. I think it was like derivatives and risk management courses on the business side uh, paired with some of the more mathematical courses on the finance side, like stochastic calculus, I remember really enjoying. Um, those have been really useful in terms of whenever I'm presented with some sort of model that, that you know, uses those concepts, Black-Scholes modeling, things like that. I can understand it a lot quicker. Like I said, I'm not the one building those models or ultimately responsible for them, but inevitably day to day, you know, there, there will be cases where I, you know, cross paths with, with, with such things and being able to understand them, even if, you know, I'm not deriving them by hand or anything like that anymore is, was pretty valuable. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I also have a question. So um, for you getting your first job, what is the interview process? What is the um, hiring process like? Um, is it more towards like personality or do they ask you specific questions about the hard skill or like financial skills that you have? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's going to vary a lot based on specifically what you're applying for and what's on your resume. So I'll give you an example. Um, I so my first job was was credit risk reporting. Um, so you know the financial modeling was a lot less applicable there, um, but I had it on my resume from this. So I remember actually being asked some very technical questions and basically people vetting my resume to make sure that you know I knew what I was talking about and actually learned the things that I was studying. Um, so I forget the specific question, but having to do some sort of, you know, mathematical equations by hand was definitely part of it. Um, and even in the current role I'm in now, I remember having to write some VBA scripts by hand because I had VBA on my resume. Um, so definitely expect to be tested on the technical side of things if you have them on your resume. And obviously, if you're applying for a more technical role. Um, but I, I think personality interviews and, you know, sort of determining character fit within the organization are going to be a part of every interview no matter what. So definitely expect those types of questions too. And in my experience, the interview process is usually at least two to three rounds of interviews um, where, you know, you'll, you'll meet progressively higher people in the hierarchy. You know, the, the guys you'll be working with day to day or your immediate manager will usually interview you in the first round or two. And then, um, you know, if you sort of make it through to the later rounds, you'll meet with higher ups in the organization. And those will generally be more like personality fit. Adam, um, you, br you bring up an interesting point about VBA. There's a lot of folks in, on the call who are the Python types of people, more on the data science-y um, kind of pure quant. But I wanted to kind of VBA kind of, we've heard it is a dying kind of animal, but at the same time, it seems like it's not. Um, kind of, can you walk us through applications, I guess, as you, from your experiences on the, uh, on the operation side, but also you have vision into the investments team and kind of what's going on there. Um, what's VBA in the, in the, in the world looking like as we speak? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. Um, I definitely agree with you that things tend to be moving towards uh, the Python side of things. I've actually picked up and learned some Python recently too, just to, you know, stay sharp with my current skills. Um, but there's still cases where I think VBA has been applicable, especially like um, if you're not in a group that is highly quantitative and, you know, financial modeling, you're going to do a lot of spreadsheet based work still, a lot of stuff in Excel. And since, you know, VBA for Excel is right there and oftentimes is a little smoother to work with. Uh, for certain, you know, functions, certain processes, we still find uses for it, for sure. I mean, I learned it back at Morgan Stanley because the way that we were producing reports was writing SQL queries from the database and then use it to, yeah, to pull data and then uh, manipulating data into pretty reports uh, via VBA into Excel. Um, so that was the most that I've ever used it. Uh, but the fact that I learned it there, I still find cases even just for my own day-to-day used to make my own life easier you know it might not be some fancy model or some deliverable i'm sending to someone else it's more like hey i can you know make this task go by 10 times quicker if i just write a couple lines of code versus a bunch of formulas and, and going through a bunch of steps in excel so i mean i would say that prioritize like if you had to pick one learn python right now for sure um but if you do have some of that vba knowledge there will be cases and uses for it and i know some other teams even in my firm have some stuff that runs on vba Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Adam. I have a question about um, what the professor also earlier touches on as well. Um, so for quant, if you enter as a quant, what 
what are the long-term career development, like the, usually the route for the quant people? Yeah, um, so I'll do my best to answer that because again, I'm not like in a, in a quant role, but just from what I've seen, um, I think obviously the most coveted jobs are generally the ones that, you know, the buy side, algo trading um, sort of shops, um, although very hard to come by, I believe. Um, and, you know, if you get in there, I think you can be, you can rise from, you know, like the analyst level up to the portfolio manager level if you're really good. Um, also, I think those are very stressful jobs. Uh, from what I understand. Um, so an, a, another route that a lot of quant people go is into risk management, which is still, you know, highly quantitative, still very competitive, but probably not quite so as those top tier like front office quant trading jobs. Um, and probably will have a little more work life balance and, and a little less stress than, than a front office role. Um, but yeah, from what I've seen, those are generally the two career paths if you really want to stay on like, you know, the quant side of things. Thank you. Hi, Adam. Um, this is a lot like broad based question, so you can take it in any route you want. But I'm sure. kind of curious, um, like what advice or insight you have to share with us as like coming out of a master's program at a time like this with COVID and, and jobs the freezing their staffing and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it's a really tough time. I, it's, I don't envy your guys position, <laughs> if I'm being very honest with you. Um, so it's probably going to be generally tougher to land that first gig. There are places that are hiring. Um, I would say that, you know, especially given the circumstances, maybe be a little more creative and, and broaden your horizons uh, in terms of, you know, the sort of offers you're looking for and would accept. Um, and then just remember that, you know, the first job you get doesn't necessarily determine the rest of your career. Get your foot in the door somewhere, you know, learn how business works, learn how functions and products work. Um, and that's a valuable knowledge that you could transfer over if there was, you know, another career path that you were more interested in. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, you might have to be willing to accept something that's not, you know, your ideal number one choice right now. Um, but that doesn't, I, I wouldn't let that discourage you because like I said, you have a long career ahead of you. And as long as you're proactive and, you know, moving in the direction that you ultimately wanted to go, there's definitely a lot to be said about, you know, getting your foot in the door somewhere and getting started. All right. Thank you. Hey Adam, um, I was just kind of curious what you look for when you're sort of trying to hire people like into your group. Like, what do you look for in terms of like your coworkers and people on your team? Just because it's a little bit more of an operations role. Yeah, uh, good question. So the, I mean, the first thing is obviously making sure that I think they have, you know, the intelligence and the technical expertise to do the things that we do. So for my team specifically, a lot of that's going to come down to product knowledge. So we generally don't hire people fresh out of school. First of all, so a lot of times we're taking people from back and middle office roles at one of the banks. So the first thing I would look for is do they have experience working with the products that we work with? Um, and, you know, we, we have a few different technical questions we go through to test on that um, and just, you know, general intelligence and problem solving skills. And after that, it's really more just, you know, character fit and motivation. You know, I want someone, especially, you know, for a junior role that's going to come in, is eager to work, is willing to put in the time. You know, my team generally works pretty long hours. So someone that we think is generally genuinely excited about the opportunity and um, someone that we think will stick around for a few years at least, uh, not someone that's looking to jump ship in six months because hiring people is tough and takes a long time and don't want to have to be constantly doing it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a combination of, um, you know, technical expertise, intelligence, and, you know, just personality fit. Thank you. I guess I have a quick question. Um, so is there any room for, you know, I've heard the term pure quant. Um, <laughs> so is there any room to, for them to work their way up? to like net, uh, network, uh, to get like a leadership role? If so, like what are the names of these leadership roles? I heard you mentioned for algo trading specifically, portfolio manager. Do you need more of the technical side to be a portfolio manager or do you need to have the good networking skills? Yeah, so I mean, I think in, in the front office role, and again, I'm, I'm speculating a bit here because this is my own career path, but so uh, when you, so portfolio manager is basically someone that, that manages and oversees a portfolio or group of portfolios, right? They're ultimately responsible for making decisions, for generating P&L. Um, 
And I think the way that you would generally, you know, rise to that rank in, you know, in that trajectory is, you know, starting out as an analyst, learning how the business works, learning how the trading strategies work, the technology and all that, and, you know, proving you can be a good decision maker. Because ultimately, those are the the roles where you're literally judged on your profits and losses. So it's, you know, making people believe that you can make money for the firm. Um, And I think if you go sort of more the risk management route, your trajectory might look a little more like mine. Mine's from the operations side, not the risk management side, but where you start off doing the more technical day-to-day things, learning how things work. And then as you get a grasp on that, moving more into like a managerial function, overseeing people doing the work that you were once doing, um, being able to take on, you know, projects, collaborate across groups to deliver results for the organization. All right. Thanks, Adam. Adam, not a specific um, networking related question, but just kind of general inquiry about markets and kind of what Cerberus does. Um, a lot of distress, middle market credit, that kind of stuff. How has that kind of played out in volatile markets that we're seeing today? Um, yeah, so it was pretty crazy. So that, yeah, back in March, April, May, when you know the, the financial markets were going completely berserk, it was, um, it was quite the experience here. I mean, we're all working like 90, 100 hour weeks. And um, what we're seeing a lot of is, so in portfolios where we use leverage, a lot of uh, margin calls were being made against us because the value of our assets was you know, dropping significantly. And so the, uh, you know, the lenders are looking for us to post collateral to make up the difference. So dealing with that on a day-to-day basis was, was pretty insane. I mean, fortunately, I think our, our firm and, and our funds are variable capitalized. So we're able to make it through that, no problem. But I think, it de- and fortunately, the, the markets rebounded relatively quickly. I think there's still an element, you know, of fear and uncertainty out there with, you know, the elections and obviously COVID's still a thing. Um, but they have stabilized a lot since those first early months. So um, I, I think one of the lasting um, effects, at least that I've seen, has been more of a focus on long-term risk management and, um, you, you know, ma- making sure that the, the walls of the fortress are solid, so to speak. You know, if, if we see another drop like that, are we capitalized? Do we have the proper controls in place to handle it? Um, but on the flip side, it's, it's also been an opportunity because for firms and, and you know, funds that are able to make it through, um, they have certain buying opportunities. You know, a lot of people in such a, an environment are forced to sell off assets at uh, unfavorable prices just because, you know, say investors are redeeming or something, or they have to meet margin calls and they don't have the funds. So they have to sell assets to raise money. So it's sort of like, I think of it as we were playing defense and playing offense. You're trying to protect your own portfolio and then opportunistically, you know, add where you see, where you see an opportunity. Thank you for that take. Hi, Adam. Um, do you see a heavier weight on risk management, like in the recent years, especially maybe after 2008 or after, you know, this COVID-19, like how does risk manage, management industry has evolved? Yeah, 100%. It, it's become much more in focus um, for obvious reasons after 2008. Um, and another one that's a little bit tangential but related to risk management is like regulatory compliance and the two kind of go hand in hand. A lot of new regulations have come out um, since 2008 with the, the Dodd-Frank Act, um, and there's been a more focus just internally, I think, for companies on, on risk management. So I think that's it's a great you know place to be in in finance right now, and I don't, I don't see that going away anytime soon. If anything, I think more regulations coming. If you look in like the EU, especially, they have way more regulation than we do here. So any firm that operates over there, compliance and risk management is uh, very much in focus these days. Hi, Adam, how are you? Yeah. Thank you very much for the, for the, for the presentation or just, just getting us into the kind of work you do. Uh, I have a question. I, when, I, when I joined in, you were speaking to the need for the need for um, soft skills. You, you mentioned that there's a need for good soft skills. What, what's, your, what's your advice on probably just fine tuning those just so that someone can be a, a better fit in terms of uh, the work you do? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Honestly, it's, it's like anything else, practice makes perfect. Um, 
I'm admittedly someone that wasn't a great, you know, networker or, or things like that when I first started. So, you know, forcing yourself to get outside your comfort zone and go do the things that you know you need to work on will, will ultimately make you better at it. Um, and, and I think once you're in a job, you know, in the working world, you're sort of forced to do that anyway. You have to interact with other people, with third parties. Um, so it's definitely something that's developed over time. You know, you see these you know, managing directors that are super polished and give these great presentations. And, you know, it's not something they were born doing. Maybe they developed that skill over the course of their career. So I'd say, you know, just any opportunity where, you know, if public speaking is something that you're not great at, you know, get out there, get out there and do it. Um, there's classes you can take. Just, it's, it's definitely, looking back now as someone that's been in the industry for a little while, definitely something that's, I think I underappreciated early in my career and that definitely benefits everyone. All right, thank you very much. Hi, Adam. Uh, I just wanted to, to go off that as, as someone who said that in your undergraduate and graduate experience, you weren't the best networker. Um, how do you propose going about networking to someone that might feel that same way, but in the age of COVID where there's no in-person interaction? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. I mean, I think with the technology we have, Zoom and things like that, it, it makes it possible to still do it. Um, I think one great strategy is to take advantage of alumni networks or if you're in a you know fraternity or play a sport as it looks like you might um, take advantage of those um, you know those communities and networks as well and just reach out to people. It might feel a little awkward, but honestly, people expect it, and most people are more than willing to you know catch up over coffee or I guess virtual coffee these days for 10, 15 minutes to tell you, you know, about their experience. And one piece of advice I'll, I'll give to everyone, people love talking about themselves. So if you ask people questions about, you know, their career and what they're doing, more than often they'll open up and, and be more than happy to talk to you. And then you have a connection and it's somewhat of a numbers game too, right? Don't expect everyone you reach out to, to, you know, have a perfect job offer for you. But if you make enough of those connections, and maintain them over time. You know, if you if you end up speaking with someone for 10, 15 minutes, shoot them a note a couple months later just to check in and catch up and you know, just maintain those those relationships and connections. And you never know what they'll, you know, turn up for you over the course of your career. Hi Adam. Um, I got a quick question. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you said you came from an uh, undergraduate accounting background and then you went straight into this annual local finance program. So you didn't have a strong background in math. It was like, I also was counting undergrad. So I like understand it's like not as much so math based. It's a lot more like due diligence and like journal entries. So, and you completed it in one year. So do you think you were able, it was like sufficient information. You're able to um, do it in one year and still retain all that information. Or would you recommend maybe saying, for a year and a half or two years and take less classes to really learn everything um, and really absorb it. Yeah, so um, so I was an accounting undergraduate, but I, I sort of identified as either my junior, I think, yeah, my junior year that I was interested in this program. So I actually pursued a minor in actuarial science, which had a lot of like the prerequisite math courses for this, like Calc 1, 2, and 3, uh, probability and statistics, those sort of things. So what I, I did do a lot of like math courses on the side, which probably helped me get through this program in one year. Um, in terms of retaining what I learned, I mean, I remember like all the concepts and stuff. If you asked me to derive Blackshaws by hand right now, I would fail miserably, um, just because it's not something I, I do day to day. Um, but I mean, my advice there would be, um, especially right now in the age of COVID, maybe not such a bad idea to try to get through it in like three semesters or two years or, or whatever, just to, you know, give the job market a little time to recover and help you, you know, get through the program with less stress and retain more. Um, Yes, it's sort of up to you also how, how much you think you can handle in a year. Um, Adam, I have two questions. Um, so number one is that uh, how much do people, um, I mean, like employers care about uh, having internships or like prior experience? Because um, as you know, COVID is happening. It's really hard for everyone to actually find a, even find like a normal job at Target. Uh, and right now I am, I'm a, I'm still an undergrad. And so it's like a really tricky situation for me where I cannot commit full time, but I also, it's also really hard to find an internship because I know employers tend to grab someone that's a full time. And also uh, a second thing is that, um, how does a higher level of education translates into the, the, um, this industry? Like, for example, do you think, um, people are looking for masters and PhD a little bit more, or is it just based on the hard skill and the soft skill, like during the process of um, 
trying to get a job. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, first question. So generally speaking, obviously, it looks great to have relevant in, uh, internship experience on your resume. And once you progress in your career, having relevant work experience. I mean, obviously, COVID's thrown everything for a loop. And I think employers will be more understanding if you don't have that, you know, perfect traditional background on your resume. I know I've hired a couple people recently who were out of a job for, for a while, obviously, because of COVID. And it's not a knock on them. It's, it's a tough environment for everyone right now. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, um, especially coming out of your um, education, not someone that's been working for a few years. I mean, really, I feel like internships are most valuable because they get you a foot in the door somewhere. A lot of people get full-time offers from their internship, um, or it helps them meet people to land interviews somewhere else. But honestly, as long as you're able to land that interview and do well in it, prove that you're motivated, smart, know what you're talking about, you'll, you'll be fine. I, I wouldn't worry too much about that right now. Um, Second question was, sorry, what was your second question? Um, so does, does it matter if like you have a PhD or a oh, master's right. degree? Or, yep. Yeah. Yep. So how does that translate into uh, job, like job hunts? Yeah. So it's going to depend very much on the specific job you're going for. So there's, I mean, there's not many jobs in finance that are going to require a PhD. Those are only going to be very, you know, unique, specific quant jobs. Um, definitely, I mean, I don't think I work with a single PhD, to be honest with you. Um, and in terms of masters, so an MBA is going to be something that'll help you get into certain jobs, especially like PE front office or investment banking. Um, the, I think the, the program here, the master's in analytical finance, there's not many pro places where that's like a prerequisite. However, it can be very beneficial, especially getting into more of the quantitative roles, like a risk management role. Um, without doing a full-blown PhD. So I, I think it's a pretty valuable program in that sense. Um, but it's, I, there's not going to be many places where it's a prerequisite necessarily. Thank you. Hmm? Adam, quick question. Um, you've been at MS and now kind of a leadership role um, at various. How much would you say is taught on the job as opposed to, you know, applying to textbook on the job? Yeah, so generally speaking, generally speaking, that is generally skewing skews heavily towards on the job. Right. So the way I always think about it is your education gives you familiarity with like the concepts uh, in general, the industry and things like that. So you don't come in day one and know nothing like it in my team, for example, someone that's studied uh, financial products and derivatives and they come in day one and I say, hey, the desk is doing, you know, this option spread trade today, they, that won't be a completely foreign language to them. However, the way we deal with it, the way it's reflected in our systems, the way our desk thinks about it is not going to be something that you're ever going to be able to taught, be taught in a classroom because everyone does things differently. Everyone's systems are different. Everyone's trading strategies are a little different. So there is an immense amount of things to learn on the job. Um, which are, So yeah, you're, you're going to learn most of it on the job as it relates to your specific function. General background, industry knowledge, things like that is what you know, your formal education is for. I think the professor just uh, stepped away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I guess if no one has any other questions. Actually, uh, I, oh. I have one more question for you. Yeah, you, sure. you mentioned earlier that you had a minor in, in actuarial science. Um, I actually also have a minor in actuarial science, but I was just wondering like what, what uh, pushed you kind of like, did you take an actuarial exam or did you take that class and realize that's not really for me? Like, going off to another thing. Can you like kind of speak on that kind of thing? Cause yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I actually passed the first two actuarial exams. So I was strongly considering that as a career path. I think I just, as I learned a little more about the industry, um, both actuarial science and finance, I thought finance would be a little more interesting and I would enjoy it a little more. So I ended up going that direction, but both are very, um, very good career choices I, you, you can't go wrong um if there's i think there's some differences to them i think actual science is a little more like structured obviously you have the exams you take which determines your career progression at the beginning 
Um, I think in terms of like earning potential, the ceiling is going to be a lot higher in finance and actuarial science, but you're also going to work a lot more and be a lot more stressed. So it, it's, you know, depends on what you're, you think you're interested in working on and then, you know, what sort of, you know, work-life balance and things like that you're interested in going forward. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, hi, Adam. Uh, so going off of that, uh, so I'm actually somebody that is considering a career path as an actuary. Oh, okay. Um, I've actually already passed the first two exams, um, like nice. you did. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any advice, uh, just like going into that profession, and like any advice just for like applying to uh, full-time jobs. Yeah, I mean, I might not be the best person to ask about this because yeah, I took a couple of exams about nine years ago now and, and never you know applied for an actual job in the industry. But from what I remember from researching it back then, um, like I said, a lot of your initial career progression is going to be based on passing all what is it six or seven exams. Um, so you know, prior I feel like prioritizing those because they are a lot. I remember studying for them and they only get harder as you go on. Um, I would say probably try to knock out as many of those as possible as early as possible. So it's not something that's lingering over your head, you know, as you get older to, to draw an analogy to finance. I have friends that are still taking, you know, the CFA and are now married with kids and, you know, trying to juggle your job and the CFA and the family is tough. So, you know, doing that while you're young and have more time would probably help you out a lot. Your 30 year old self will thank you. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks. Just uh, to pick up from that, how useful are these credentials on uh, on actual application, like the CFA and the FRM? I mean, I know they're good as a credential to have on the resume, but how is it? Are they really are they encouraged when you're in industry, or do they? Do you, in your opinion, do you think they actually add a certain marginal benefit towards uh, an individual? Yeah, so I mean, someone I think who's definitely... the, who has a graduate degree like we are pursuing here. Yeah. Right. So I think it definitely does actually provide some marginal benefit. And, you know, you learn more, you have to study a lot of different things when you take these exams and programs. So it definitely makes you a better candidate. And, you know, the more knowledge you have, the better. Um, I do think that the greater benefit to them is how it looks on your resume and the doors that it opens for you. Um, in my experience, at least in my line of work, CFA looks great, CPA looks great, um, MBA less so in my specific line of work, but it's obviously highly valued in things like investment banking, front office, private equity, or like management consulting. So I, I think it is a great thing to do to um, open certain doors for you, especially if you're looking to make like a career change, say you're working a couple years in a certain job and you're more interested in something else, something like having a CFA in your resume can help you make that jump. But it's with these things, I think it's a very, um, you know, individual decision based on your personal circumstances. I don't have any, I don't have a CPA, CFA, MBA, just I did this master's program. I've been working ever since. Um, so yes, there, there are certain use cases for them, but they're not um, generally, you know, necessary prerequisites. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Adam. Thank you very much for your time. I think hopefully they grilled you enough and uh, <laughs> took a pound of flesh out of you. Uh, <laughs> no, but, you know, you offer, so now please, you offer an interesting perspective every, every week when I'm really going, uh, we'll, after, your, after your call, we'll have a discussion to discuss, uh, you know, what, uh, what this means for them, because, um, especially now, especially now. Great. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so for much. your time. Have a good one, everyone. Okay. Bye.